Dr. Keith Scully, welcome to Nervous Habits Podcast. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for, for being here, for agreeing to, to take the time to have this conversation. Um, so you are a producer and a director of nature documentaries for television and cinema. I know you've worked on a dozen and a half productions over the last few decades. What, what sort of prompted your interest in this? Well, I started my life as a kid in Kenya. And um, I used to go on safari. This was before, it's in the 60s, before really tourism got going. And um, so I had a lot of experiences with African wildlife at a very early age. And I think from then on, it was, it was really obvious that's where my career was going to go. And so against the recommendation of um, a lot of my teachers at school, I went to do zoology at university. They said, oh, you'll never get a job. And um, <laughs> I ended up getting the best job I could ever have had. So I, yeah, I went, I studied as a zoologist. I did research as a zoologist. And then um, by a fluke, got into wildlife filmmaking and um, I've never looked back since. That, that That's amazing. So I guess in the 60s, the zoology degree didn't have as much utility as, as maybe it does today. Yeah, well, it, was, well, it wasn't until the 80s I actually got as far as the uh, getting the degree degree but uh yeah i think it was always thought of if you if you're a zoologist that you would you you might get employed what have you but um it would be kind of a hard graft in terms of career and everything because there weren't that many jobs certainly in in the uk most people who studied zoology at that time would move into other things so i was lucky i stayed it, with animals for the rest of my life yeah, I mean, you're, you're someone who uh, obviously you've, you've dedicated your career to uh, animals uh, and wildlife and uh, environmental preservation. Did you did you have, you know, uh, any any exotic animals growing up or, or um, sort of what was what was your relationship um, to, to just animals in general? Well, I remember there was a place we used to go to is a is a national park in Kenya called Amboseli, and they had this extraordinary big bull elephant that used to come to the little little set of, they were sort of self-catering banders, we called them, little houses. And, um, and this elephant was completely trusting of people. And he would be, he would, you, there's a little swimming pool there and you'd be in the swimming pool and he could come and drink from the swimming pool when you're in it. And um, he was called a dinga. And a dinga was the head of um, the opposition movement in Kenya at that time. It was President Kenyatta was the president and the Dingo Dingo was the opposition. The funny thing is that to this day now in Kenya, um, there's a President Kenyatta who is Kenyatta's son and the head of the opposition is a Dingo, mm. the other son. <laughs> but anyway, the Dingo I remember is this amazing elephant. And I just learned that this animal that could destroy you in a millisecond had complete understanding and trust to people. And um, yeah. I still have a picture my father took of him in my dining room, and I look at a dinger a lot. That's beautiful. I, I feel like it, it's always the the most majestic creatures that that are are sort of the most the most gentle. Um, so you're obviously based out of the UK. I, I got to ask you, Keith. You know, in America, environmental advocacy and awareness uh, of these problems is actually a political issue that's really only been endorsed by one side. Do you see that sort of uh, politicization of this issue in the UK? Yeah, I think for some reason the the environment has always been politicized globally. I, th I, I, I and I I'm really sorry that that was allowed to kind of happen because actually the environment should be something that's apolitical because we all need a healthy environment to have a healthy civilization and so on and so forth. So it should be off the books. And I, I guess especially climate change became well was very politicized I say there's a lot of big business and money involved and so that was an inevitability um but I do think we're coming out of this this period now I I do think I, I see changes now where people are actually realizing that whatever political persuasion you are you do have to have a functioning planet mm -hmm. to carry on with your life and um, that I think is becoming a common realization. It's taking some time in some places, but um, by and large, I've seen, especially in the last five or six years, there's been a huge change of attitude. I also think that young people very much look at the future that's ahead of them. And when you look at the evidence of the future ahead, 
it's scary and young people want something done about it so i think again you've got a demographic change um guys of my generation we haven't really done a good job so um <laughs> yeah i, I mean <laughs> look, you guys I, to turn it around i think i definitely think you're right that um you do see it, it's more I, I don't know if the word is is like socially acceptable or it's cool for young people to care about the environment but you definitely see for millennials and for gen z um this sort of you know social justice activism when it comes to the environment where for the boomers and i don't know if it's it's you know, because they're not necessarily going to be around, you know, for we're going to discuss what's happening, you know, in future decades, or maybe it's just because it's the, you know, they were brought up in a culture where they weren't, you know, talking about climate change and the loss of biodiversity and the warming of the planet. I, I don't know if it's one or the other. Yeah, I think, there, you know, when I grew up, the, the idea that we could completely destroy, overfish the whole ocean was absurd. Mm. You know, how could that possibly happen? Now, it, it's common knowledge because we've actually done it. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that the Amazon rainforest could come to an end was, was absurd, um, but now it's a real possibility. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what has happened, and I think you're very, you're, you often, when you grow up, you see the world at that time when you grow up and you get set in that, that sets your mind and your thinking. It's very hard then as you get older to try and break that thinking. And I, you know, I struggle with that myself. Um, so I think for young people, you absolutely know that humans can change the world, can completely uh, for better or for, for worse, because you, you're seeing it around you. And you're also looking into a, an uncertain future, which we didn't, we weren't, 60s, 70s, we weren't looking at, on, everything was golden ahead of us. Mm. Yeah, and that's actually part of why I wanted to have this conversation with you. You know, I, I I do have a lot of young listeners in the podcast, but I also have folks who are maybe from, you know, a different generation who I guess don't understand the seriousness of what lies ahead. And obviously, you know, you had your your phenomenal documentary with Netflix, A Life on Our Planet. Um, and the first thing I, I want to tell you, Keith, having seen the film, it was an extremely moving uh, depiction of what's going on. And emotionally, it was really difficult to watch, you know, just sort of taking stock of how much damage we we as humans have done to the world around us. It, it was it was emotionally draining. So I can imagine that actually making the film, you had the same experience. Yeah, I, it, it is emotionally draining. And I think for someone like Sir David Attenborough, who, you know, obviously the film was framed around him and everything that, you know, David was born into a pretty much a pristine planet. And so he's seen this whole change. And, and, uh, and uh, when he was traveling as a young man in the 50s, most of the natural world was, was intact in, in an amazing kind of way. So he's seen this massive change. So for him personally, I think it's, it's, it's really sad to look back on it. Um, I think there's also, again, people of our generation, that there's a kind of the sense of responsibility that we let it happen. Um, especially as broadcasters and communicators, did we do a really bad job telling people about the change and so on and so, so forth? So there's a whole bunch of mixed emotions in, in there. But at the end of the day, I mean, I still think, you know, that we're in this junction where we can still turn it around. And that was the real thing about the film. We would say we're, we're at this kind of magic moment. Humanity's at this little junction well, not little junction, it's a huge, massive junction. Right. But we can go one way or the other. And it's it's really funny. It boils down to the next decade. And I always say we're the most important people that have ever lived because no other people on the planet have had in their power the ability to change everything, not for a thousand years, 10,000, maybe a hundred thousand years. Mm -hmm. we, we, and it's going to happen in this decade and the following one. And if we get it right, we sort it. And everyone who follows us for 10,000 years look back and say, they did it, they fixed it. But if we don't fix it, they'll look back with a very other, a darker view of what we, of what we did or didn't do. 
and we're going to speak um, later on about, you know, sort of the, the hypothetical future that you lay out, right? Like if, if, if we don't do anything, what it's going to look like. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, you mentioned Sir David Attenborough. For my American listeners who are maybe less familiar with him, um, he's been uh, presenting natural history documentaries for BBC for decades. And he actually considers your documentary his personal witness statement of his life in the future. So, Keith, what was it like working with the 94-year-old uh, Attenborough? Well, I've known David a long time, but the first job I ever got in television when I was 24 uh, was working on his second big landmark series, which, which was um, called The Living Planet. His first big natural history series was Life on Earth. And the interesting thing then, I, it was made with the BBC and um, David had had this huge career in the BBC. I mean, when I met him as 24, he was already in his 50s. Um, and but he was going to be the director general of the BBC, so the big, the top guy. And David, when you meet him, he's the he's a powerful person, the sort of guy you'd expect who would become the director general of the BBC. Mm -hmm. So everyone around him was in awe of David then because he was gonna he was the big boss, and he just decided he just didn't want to be the director general. He wanted to go back to filmmaking, and he'd started this extraordinary career going back to filming wildlife. Um, which again is a sense of the power of the man. Um, so when you meet, what you see on the screen with David Ashton is a tiny slither of the man. You know, he, this, this is an awesome guy. And um, he's, he's what we call Renaissance man. Uh, he, he knows a lot about natural history. He knows an incredible amount about anthropology. Um, I believe he could have been a classical pianist. He is, his understanding of music is fantastic and, and what have you. And his broad knowledge of everything globe is, is great. So um, when you're surrounded with this guy, the, 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 the sense of power is, is a radius from, from him. And you know, you, David likes people to be on their toes. So I've, I've lived with this all my life and um, I've made films with David all my life. And, and um, the one thing is that um, would always happen at the end when you made a film with, with, with David, you'd show it to him. And um, usually you would say, oh, that's fantastic, well done. And sometimes you'd say nothing. And then I, I learned not to ask because when I did ask, <laughs> you'd say, well, wasn't really up to it. <clears throat> and it's, you know, David is like a father, but, you know, he tells you, well, you didn't quite make it, mate. And so you never want to have that again, because the sense of disappointing David Attenborough is huge. So, of course, when we came to make this film, which is his witness statement, his life story, the, the we didn't we really didn't want to get it wrong. Right. <laughs> well, you know, we didn't. So the, there was a lot of. Yeah, we we all as a team, I think we all we all wanted to make sure that it was a really important statement because we knew how much it meant to him. So. But the great thing about David, say he's always made us better, mm. the whole industry. Wildlife is strong in Britain because of David Attenborough, because of that drive he gave to everything. He's an amazing guy. Definitely. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it certainly sounds like, and I think the fact that he's so, you know, he, he, he's so uh, forthright with you guys, you don't have to sort of wonder uh, if after the fact, did he like it? Did he not like it? You know, you know, you know what his, what his sentiments are. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, and Keith, did you... Uh, just so the listeners are aware, most of the documentary, you know, David is, is traveling around the world. He's, you know, going to all different um, environments from the rainforest to the beaches um, to the Arctic. Did you get to travel with him and, and see all of those different ecosystems? I have done in the past um, and I went and worked on, on, on different shows. For this actual film, um, because David is 94, um, and they still, I mean, you wouldn't know, David is like, at 94, he's like a guy in his late 50s. Right. Um, <laughs> but but um, you still, we don't travel, he doesn't travel quite what he did. So we only actually went to two places abroad. We went to Kenya, because mm. um, um, there's special stories there. And we also took him to Chernobyl, which was, which was an interesting thing to kind of do. The rest of the shows of, of seeing him around were from, were archived from his past life. Um, right. And in past, 
series where I've worked with him, I've been on some of those adventures, um, but they came from all over the place. So you mentioned Chernobyl. So that's where the documentary starts and ends talking about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, which you call the single most costly event in human history. So when you were sort of, you know, storyboarding this film, when you were, you know, laying everything out ahead of time, why did you choose to start the conversation at Chernobyl? Because there's a the, the interesting thing about Chernobyl is, is that all this whole city existed um, next to this power station and um, everyone was having a normal life. And, and, and then suddenly on one day um, when the reactor melted down um, because of human errors, um, all those people had to leave in 48 hours. And the place where they, one day they were living in a completely perfect civilization and the next day it was over. They had to move on. And there's a kind of a metaphor for the situation we are on our planet. At present, we're living wonderfully um, in this beautiful world, but there's a Chernobyl sitting next to all of us, mm. which is ticking away that can suddenly make our world uninhabitable by us. Mm. So as a starting point, it was fantastic. As an end point, it's also what's interesting is um, people have had to leave. You can't stay there for any length of time. You can go into Chernobyl for a few days and it's fine, but you can't stay. Um, so no one has lived there since. And um, But the forest has regenerated, has taken over the, the city and all these different creatures, often rare creatures like wolves, Pesarski's horse and so on and so, so, so forth, have taken back over the city. So there's a kind of, the idea at the end was, okay, nature will move on, will live on through this disaster. We may create a period and there may be a mass extinction, what have you, but one way or the other, nature will probably prevail. The big question is, will we? Mm. And um, so that's how we end the film, is Ch Chernobyl in a way teaches us to really important lessons and actually i love keith i love that i love that last shot of the film zooming out and sort of showing the the buildings and the forest sort of in harmony um you know coming full circle showing how the the wild has reclaimed the space in in chernobyl i think that was really beautiful so for those who who have yet to see the documentary the the key you know theme that that uh that i noticed that you kept coming back to was biodiversity and about mm -hmm. how the the loss of biodiversity is the biggest threat to the planet really so for for the ordinary person who's less familiar with with these issues what what is biodiversity and, and why is it important i always like to start actually at the beginning of the earth um this rock we live on called the earth um has been around for three three and a half billion years and, and um if you take the history of earth as a beer glass. Now I'm talking about, we, we drink Guinness over here. I don't know if you know, I mean a beer with a lot of foam on top, okay? Yeah, we drink so, a lot of like Bud Light, a lot, a lot Bud of Light. watery beers in just, It's gotta have a bit of foam on top. Okay. Because all the bit which has got no foam is the history of our earth before life, when it was a raging rock. And the only bit in the history of our earth um, which you'd recognize as life, is a, bit, is a little bit of foam on top. So what happened? How, how did this raging rock, volcanic, toxic gases, no ozone layer, uninhabitable, you know, unbreathable atmosphere, the only thing that tamed the rock was life. Life actually, first of all, created a breathable atmosphere, an ozone layer, the whole kind of works. But it also started to bring stability. And as the planet became more stable, life became more complex. And so the world became more stable and it was history process. And the only reason we live on a stable planet with stable seasons, stable atmosphere, stable everything is because of the relationship and the geology of the earth and the life that lives on it. Mm -hmm. So life, so biodiversity, if you ignore life, you lose stability. And every time that there's been mass extinction events on this planet, it's beginning because the world has become so unstable that life can't work. And then it, you get this runaway effect. 
So to, to consider the world that life is not important is, is madness because it's the only thing that gives us the stability. And our societies, our civilizations thrive on stability. We're not good with instability. So you need nature. And biodiversity works, the more complex life is, the more stability, it, it, the more, it, it basically locks the world into a more and more stable zone. So biodiversity for us is safety. It brings us all that safety net. And if you erode it and pull it away, it starts to break down, things become unstable, and our world and our lives and our futures become unstable. And that is the most important thing. Biodiversity is not nice to have. Mm. People often think, oh, you know, you've got to love nature because, oh, we love all the creatures. And isn't it sad it's going? It's nothing to do with that at all. Right, well, it right. is sad. I, I find it sad. <laughs> but, but that's not the issue. The issue is it leads to instability. Right. And um, our civilization, modern human beings with civilization have only ever existed in very stable conditions. We have no experience of anything else. Yeah, and that's that's a point that you hammer home uh, towards the end when we talk about like what we can do to you know prevent the future from becoming a reality and, and sort of restoring that biodiversity, which which we'll touch on later. Maybe the most startling thing about the film, Keith, was seeing the graphics that you had up. How as the world population grew, the wilderness declined. So when David, um, you know, he took us back to 1937 where he grew up. And the population, he noted, was 2.3 billion. The remaining wilderness was 66%. Nowadays, to, to, to listeners, nowadays in 2020, 7.8 uh, 7 billion population, and the remaining wilderness is 35%. So we're down almost half in, you know, eight, 80, 83 years, Keith? I mean, these are staggering figures. They, 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 they are. And, and um, well, again... You have to look at what is really staggering from a biologist's point of view is that, is that life systems and geology work on geological time. And so normally big changes happen to our Earth over, say, a million years. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take a million years and say, okay, that's a 12-hour day, um, and we have changed a huge amount in 50 years because it really is the last 50 years in david's life stuff happens well if you have the same kind of out of a million years to 12 hour day 50 years is two seconds so it's one and two and so what we've done actually is rather like a meteor meteorite strike and one of the great extinction events that happened most people are familiar with the end of the dinosaurs was a meteorite strike hmm. but we're sort of simulating that same thing by changing so much so quickly. Life can't quite cope with that. And that's a really worrying thing. And, and um, you start to get what we call them tipping points where things you get, you erode a wilderness or biodiversity to a certain point, and then it starts to erode itself. It, 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 having been very stable, it starts to run away. And um, the biggest example of that is the Amazon rainforest, mm. which is, um, Currently, the Amazon rainforest always created its own rain, and and um, it needs to create its own, own own rain, but it has to be of certain scale to create sufficient rain to keep the whole thing working. And as it's being eroded, it's coming to this what they call a tipping point where it won't create enough rain, and then it'll just switch to become a dry savanna, um, and so the whole thing billions of species will go and what have you, but it'll then no longer create rain. Most of South American agriculture relies on, the, they call it the river and the sky, on the, the rainfall that is generated by the Amazon. So the irony is, with our agriculture, get more agriculture by deforestating the Amazon, mm -hmm. they're going to probably kill, wreck the whole of the agricultural system of tropical and um, subtropical South America, because actually the the rain all comes from that system and that and that and that forest and scientists are really really worried about that but that's a, what they call one of these tipping points where stuff starts to run away the terrifying thing of tipping point is is once it's gone you it, it's like the dam's broken you can't you can't, you can't do anything about it, it just can't unscramble away. the egg once, once no the egg. you can't unscramble the egg yeah i'm glad you mentioned the rainforest because 
that's that's something where I don't think people realize just how much biodiversity is in the rainforest. And and I know in the documentary you mentioned that in a single small patch of tropical rainforest, there could be 700 different species of tree, as many as there are in the whole of North America. And the documentary yeah. mentions that half of the world's rainforests have already been cleared and that we cut down over 15 billion trees each year. Yeah. No, it's, it's on a, it is on a staggering scale. And actually, it's all those those different trees and all the insects and everything acting together, as I say, which creates this stable system that then generates the rain. And again, the thing I always bang on about is, OK, you might think it's very sad that insects and what have you are being wiped out, species are going, and, and I, I do. I think it's sad. But the point is, what is the, going to be the impact on us? All my life as a wildlife filmmaker, conservation was all about trying to save species because we thought we should. We thought that there was um, a moral obligation to keep things as, as they were. Um, to me, the last 20 years, that has all changed. It's now, they're no longer just nice to have. It is essential for us. They are our defense force. I honestly think that the what the natural world and its services provide, like the Amazon provides the rain, the agriculture, the watering of the agriculture of the South American subcontinent, con, 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 continent, um, it's not nice to have, it's essential to have. And so it becomes an issue of, you know, you'd call it national security in America, mm. because if anything is going to actually threaten your, your people, your civilization, so on, you you stop it, you have a defense force, you have all sorts of things, you have the biggest defense force in the world to protect your citizens. And we need an international, we have, need to have international security and international defense against these things that can damage us far more, I'm afraid, than terrorist groups and so on and so, so forth. Um, these are things that eat away at the fundamentals of our civilization and um, we can't afford to let them run away. Yeah, and this is this is the part of the documentary where I mentioned it was emotionally draining, just sort of, um, and and the whole thing was was very beautifully uh, choreographed and and edited together. But just seeing, you know, all of these different species um, in the rainforest, for example, we'll talk about the oceans in a moment, just slowly becoming endangered and extinct. I, I want to make sure people really can grasp the gravity of that number. 8 billion people in 2020, 35% remaining wilderness. Like, like, I mean, you do the math, guys. If you, you know, go another 30, 40, 50 years, there's not going to be a lot left. Um, this is not something where we can afford to wait another, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, leave it to the next generation. We need to act now. And, and that's something um, that we're going to keep coming back to in this conversation. Yeah, the world is finite. And, and so you can't, eventually you run out of world. Um, whichever way you 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 look at it, so you and um, and when you run out of world, uh, basically you run out of stability at the same time, and and um, yeah, that's that's the issue. So let's let's talk about the oceans, Keith. When people think about the problems with the environment, they don't usually think about the ocean. Um, but the documentary talks about how, due to overfishing, there is a serious dearth of fish left in the ocean. We've overfished, I think it was 30% of fish stocks to their critical levels. What, you know, how serious of a problem is this? Well, obviously the, the thing what's happening with fishing is that you, if you can imagine you had a bank account, um, say you had a million dollars in it. Now, what most people do is they, um, they have their bank account and it makes interest every year and you spend the interest, but you keep your million dollars safe. Um, what's happening in the ocean is the, the million dollars, the capital, is just being eaten into. And what all conservationists want to do with the ocean is just, if you have a big enough stock of fish, and you just take the interest, that stock actually grows and grows and you get more and more fish. Um, so that's the, that's, so what we're doing right now, you never, you never, a farmer would never eat their seed corn hmm. every year. Um, and a banker will, will, if there's a good banker, won't eat into all its capital because he knows there's, there's, that's the end of it. But in the oceans, for some reason, because it doesn't belong to anyone, most of it, that's what's happened. The other thing though, which is more crucial of what we now know, 
is that things like large fish in the sea, whales and other things, have a hugely important part on stimulating the productivity of the ocean. Um, whales, for example, and uh, we nearly killed whales off in the 70s, knowing nothing about their contribution to the ocean, but they are very important in helping to circulate nutrients, which stimulate the growth of plankton, which makes the ocean more productive. And the more, ironically, the more fish in the sea, the more productive it, it is. So um, again, it's, um, it's, it's sad we're losing fish, but it's also the, the loss of the productivity mm -hmm. is disastrous for you and me. And why it's disastrous is because we've got this big carbon problem right now. And the biggest carbon sump the world has is the ocean. Now, if you just leave the ocean alone, it'll suck carbon out faster than anything. Um, and, um, but if you destroy it, um, it stops providing that function. And if people believe that global warming is the problem for most individuals on the surface of the planet, which I believe it is, we need a healthy ocean just to help us sort that problem, that alone. And um, the irony is, is that we can have our cake and eat it. If you protect the ocean, scientists have worked this out, if you rigidly protect 30%, you can fish everything you want out of the remaining 60 because the 30% will always be generating so many more fish that there'll be plenty to have. But at present, the way we're going, we're going to have no fish in the sea and we're going to lost our carbon sink. Yeah, and, and it's, inter right. it's interesting you bring up the carbon um, issue. That, that was probably the, the thing that I took most away from the documentary, just in terms of factually what I learned. I didn't know this, that the ocean was masking the problem of global warming. I think in America, we obviously have a situation where you have a lot of climate change deniers, people who are resisting the science. But can you just explain sort of like, like ex as explicitly as you can, how the ocean is masking the seriousness of, of climate change? I think, so what would happen, because you, the ocean has a current system where it, 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 it sucks warm water, um, falls down to the ocean depths and cools and so on, the ocean has a huge ability to absorb heat. Mm. Um, and for until really probably about 30 years ago, it was doing a really good job of doing that. And no one really noticed it changing, um, it, it changing its temp temperature, but also it was holding the atmospheric temperature down. But suddenly the ocean lost the ability to do that. And so the ocean recently has been heating up very, very quickly. And, and as it heats up, of course, it heats the atmosphere. So, so again, it's as opposed to being, um, taking heat out of the system it's now going to start adding heat into the system so so it did mask it but now it's probably going to become an accelerator of it so the the um the ocean is obviously completely crucial to our our, our kind of climate um and everything that happens uh, if you live in the atlantic tropical atlantic you will know what last year's hurricane season was like i mean we ran out of the um European alphabet and we had to get to the Greek alphabet and we ran out nearly ran out of that to name all the storms yeah That's never happened before in in the history of hurricanes and the Pacific is the same story um but this is this is just physics this is just basic if you if the ocean becomes warmer it, it, it puts more um humidity into into the air and you'll get more and more violent storms I mean it's it, it's not rocket rocket science um so yeah, I mean, I think there are people who still kind of want to deny climate change, but I think they're becoming a, I think they're becoming a smaller and smaller group. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and, and there's, there's so much evidence, and, and I'm glad you brought up because I hadn't even planned to mention the tropical storms, but addi additional evidence of climate state, uh, changes with the more turbulent hurricane seasons. So I hope that folks who are maybe you know more skeptical of it also look into that aspect of the science. Um, something else you mentioned in the documentary with respect to climate change, which was really convincing. So it had taken volcanic activity up to 1 million years to dredge up enough carbon, carbon from within the earth to trigger a mass catastrophe. But by burning millions of years worth of living organisms all at once in the form of carbon, uh, excuse me, in the form of coal and oil, we've managed to do so in less than 200 years. So yeah. uh, sort of taking a, a million years 
of carbon from the volcanoes and burning it and doing the same damage in 200 years. Yeah, it's, um, I think people, what they don't understand is that carbon is, is carbon dioxide and carbon is, is part of the geological process that of the, whereby the earth operates. And um, it's, it's, um, and the balance of carbon dioxide is crucial to the balance of everything about our world. And generally what normally happens is that volcanoes pump a certain amount of CO2 every year into the atmosphere. Plants need that carbon dioxide to be able to grow, photosynthesize and, and to make food for every, everything. So we need CO2. It's absolutely crucial. Um, but what goes in from the volcanoes is taken out by nature or other weathering forms. There are other systems. But in a couple of periods in our Earth's history, volcanoes went crazy. Mm. And the worst time they went crazy was, uh, it's called the End Permian. It's a mass extinction event. And it's when all the continents of the world came crash to, to, to together. And especially in Siberia, it causes incredible volcanic activity, which covered hundreds of thousands of kilometers um, of Siberia with lava at least two kilometers deep. It was unprecedented scale. But the lava didn't cause the problem, it was the CO2. And what happened was the CO2, this story might sound familiar, started a runaway climate change effect. Mm -hmm. And um, so the world was getting hotter and hotter. At the same time, it, it superheated the ocean, which is what's going on now. But as carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean, it forms carbonic acid. And so the ocean acidifies, and we're seeing the ocean acidify now. The vast majority of plankton and a lot of creatures in the sea have skeletons of calcium carbonate. You know, your, 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 your seashell is made of calcium carbonate. This dissolves in acid. And um, so these creatures all die out. And they stop then absorbing carbon and they become a carbon emitter. And what happened in the Permian, the thing got so run away that the ocean started emitting carbon dioxide itself, basically absorbing it, and all sorts of other toxic gases and storms, biblical <laughs> schemes. Um, and the Permian, 96% of species went extinct. Um, life was nearly wiped out. And it took 10 million years until life got back to normal again. 10 million years. Wow. So the lesson from that, and it happened again, the end tertiary was another CO2 event. So on two occasions, CO2 has caused, or just on its own, a chain reaction, a mass extinction. The last thing you do, if you see that history in the earth, would you think, hey, hang on guys, should we create a mass, should we simulate a mass volcanic event by just pumping gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere? Yeah. No, you wouldn't. And you combine that with what I talked about earlier with the meteorite effect of destabilizing mm -hmm. um, the, uh, biodiversity, which is the carbon sum. Uh, this didn't happen in the Permian. You didn't have a meteorite and a volcano happening simultaneously. You're playing with fire. And we, in this 50 year period, are playing dangerously with, with fire. And it's really important that people understand why you have to row back. Because these things together, take us to a very unsafe place, to a place we don't know, and we have no experience of, and we don't know where it's gonna end. And so that's why there's a climate change conference happening in Glasgow at the end of this year. I always say it's probably the most important meeting humanity will ever have. Wow. Because if what they decide at that meeting will affect everything going forwards, because they have to decide, they're either gonna deal with it, and then we're, we've got, we're in a situation of hope right. or business as usual, and there's no hope. And those people will, history will look back on them, what they decide as the moment when humanity went one way or the other. And it's a, it's a huge moment because in 10 years time, I'm sorry, the horse is bolted. I mean, you mentioned earlier, uh, I forgot what the question was, but but you talked about this being an international problem. And I think that's part of what, you know, needs to needs to come out of these conversations, like the one in Glasgow, is it can't just be 
the Americas or the UKs of the world addressing this issue. We need every single country coming together and saying, you know, and, and we'll speak about solar energy and, and you know, measures we can take, but the, the, this is the step-by-step plan that we're going to put in place to prevent this reality from, from occurring. Uh, it's not something that only one country can do alone. Yeah, and if, you know, if COVID has t- taught us anything, um, if, you know, you can't deal with a pandemic just on your own. Um, and um, this pandemic has come out from the destruction of nature. You know, it's a, it's a zoonotic, it's an animal d- disease. We should never have, these diseases are popping up all over the place in a way they've never done before because of our interaction with nature. It's part of that, of our d- destructive relationship with bio, bio, biodiversity. But, but again, COVID, you know, you can't, you know, it'll originate in one country, but the way we're configured now, it's going to spread around the globe very quickly, as right. co- the coronavirus did. And um, so, yeah, you international, you, you can't solve global problems with a national strategy mm-hmm. because the CO2 someone else is pumping out, if someone isn't going to play ball, um, everything you might be doing in the States to remove CO2, um, if Europe and China carry on pumping it out, well, you're wasting your time. Exactly. It has to be an agreement. Um, so I, I, I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about animal species more, more generally. And the documentary mentions that, um, just a couple numbers for, for listeners, 70% of the mass of birds on this planet are domestic birds. And the vast majority of those are chickens. Um, we account for over one third of the weight of mammals on earth and a further 60% of mammals we raise to eat. And the rest of all of these animals from mice to whales make up just 4%. And as I mentioned before, and <laughs> dwindling, it's, that's remarkable to think about the fact that where you know 96% of animal of mammals ourselves included are being you know uh, used either for for domestic purposes or or to consume and 4% of, of animals that you see out in the world that's that you know th- that's all they constitute it's it's remarkable yeah no, it's, it's it's it is staggering um, the other staggering statistic which you didn't actually put in the film was the um, the way insect populations have been crashing hmm. and um, there's a very famous biologist called E.O. Wilson, who um, studied in insects and what have you, and he said it was it's going to be the loss of the little things that'll probably undo us. And he's absolutely right because um, insects, obviously, you know, pollinating insects, all our crops, or well, the majority of them, rely on insect po- pollination, and um, but they 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 fertilize our soil. They do all these incredible jobs for us. Um, but there's a sort of silent extinction going on because of a massive use of pesticides and all sorts of other things of the insect population of the world. And it's sort of thing, it's as insidious because suddenly it'll go and the thing will break down mm. and you'll think, ah, oh, <laughs> these crops aren't growing anymore. <laughs> well, it's because you've got no, you, there's, there's nothing left in the soil for them to be able to, to, to grow. So it's this erosion of the wild world of biodiversity um, is a ticking time bomb. It's going to be the little things that undo us. Uh, that's that's yeah. uh, that, that's something I think people are going to remember from this conversation. So, Keith, to people listening who might think it's inconceivable that we as a single species might have the power to threaten the very existence of the wilderness, as you mentioned with the beer glass analogy, you know, the, this environmental... Um, you know, status quo has been in place for millions of years. What would you say to the people listening who think it's who think we have just not been here long enough to be able to have made that impact? I think just just you have to just look at you have to look at the evidence, I guess, out, out, out outside you. I mean, I I always say go back and and look at the evidence, but um, if you just you know satellite data will, will just show. Um, how much change we have made in the past 50 years. And then you have to then look at the amount of change, say the whole period of the Roman Empire had on the earth, insignificant. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, 
And um, so, so you have to kind of look at it in, in the sort of context of, um, yeah, of the last 50 years. And, and um, whether it be your local city, your local town, your, what's going on outside your door. Uh, and um, if you're my age, think back to how it was when you were a kid, when we were in Britain when I was a kid, um, if you went for a long drive, your um your windscreen would get covered in smashed insects hmm. on your windscreen a lot of times in britain even in the summertime that doesn't happen anymore where have all those insects gone they just don't exist so so something has fundamentally changed and i think it's just question what's happened around you i think the other thing to do is to question you know you, we're seeing all sorts of evidence. We talked about the hurricanes, but you know, if you're California, you know about forest fires, you're Australian, you know about forest fires, you see ice caps melting and so on and so forth. There, there, there's a huge amount of things that weren't going on even 20 years ago, but certainly not 40 years ago when I was a kid. So you've got to just ask, you know, is that all just, is, it, is that just by chance? Um, but then look at the, the science because the, these things are all predicted to happen and they, they've come as no surprise. Um, and, um, you know, we knew this year was going to be a really, really bad hurricane season because it's a La Nina and um, we know that the temperature of the sea is warmer. So everyone predicted it was going to be a mass hurricane season and sure enough it was. But you look at the predictions for what the next La Nina will be in 10 years time and it makes this one look like no problem at all. So you have to just look at the evidence and see. There's there's one thing that's really interesting though about, I think that, that where people should really, really fear the loss of stability of our planet. And that's, I was take people back to the history of humanity. Um, they, people now understand, you know, modern human beings, anatomically modern human beings, people like you and me, identical to us, have been around for at least 200,000 years. And for 95% of that period, um, we were limited to being hunter gatherers in tiny populations. Hmm. So until the last 10,000 years, that's what we're, so, so 200,000 years of being restricted to that way of life. And why was that? Well, the temperature of the earth was bouncing up and down the overall by 10 degrees, sometimes 10 degrees in a decade, because we went in and out of ice ages and all sorts of stuff. And all humans could do with all their cleverness and everything we had about us um, was exist as hunter gatherers, because we couldn't farm, we couldn't crop. 10,000 years ago, suddenly the temperatures just stabilized. It's a geologist called the last 10,000 years, the Holocene. We came out the last ice age and circumstances just dropped into place and temperature did not vary for plus or minus one degree, 10,000 years. Hmm. 10,000 years ago, people all over the world started domesticating plants and agriculture was born. And 10,000 years later, we put a man on the moon. But the same people who'd languished for 200,000 years as hunter-gatherers, suddenly, boom, invented agriculture, put a man on the moon. And as a scientist friend I know, he said, it looks interesting, if the Holocene had happened 50,000 years ago, we probably would have put a man on the moon 40,000 years ago, because the same thing would have happened with the same people. Right. But our civilization, only farming effectively, and civilization which comes from farming, only works when you can rely on the seasons, when you can rely on the stability. And the, the thing that's really, I think, terrifying is, once you blast yourself out of that, which we are doing, you know, we've gone up, you know, one degree already, we're going to go past 1.5 soon. It sounds like small amounts, but they, the, the, the knock on effect towards instability, we have no experience that our civilizations can actually operate um, in this world that we're going to. And so that's why you know, again, I come back to the urgencies of these climate change meetings and this place where I, why I bang on about this stuff is because we still have a chance to pull ourselves back to the Holocene. We still can come back to that place where we're comfortable and we can thrive. 
and everyone's got to be on that ticket, I think, and try and do it. Definitely. And, and at the risk of, of um, sort of beat, beating a dead horse with the urgency, um, you know, theme here, uh, I do want to take a moment and sort of talk about what the future that you laid out in the documentary, um, where essentially you went de- decade by decade and you prognosticated this is what the world will be like if we continue on the path that we're on. Um, so, for example, for listeners who have, have not yet seen the documentary uh, in the 2030s, the Amazon rainforest will be cut down until it can no longer produce enough moisture, bringing catastrophic species loss and altering the global water cycle. Um, In the 2050s, as the ocean continues to heat and becomes more acidic, as Heath said, uh, fish populations will crash. In the 2080s, global food production will enter a crisis as soils become exhausted by overuse. And finally, in the 2100s, so, you know, 80 years from now, our planet will become four degrees warmer. Large parts of the earth, believe it or not, will be uninhabitable and millions will be rendered homeless, leading to, you guys posit, a sixth mass extinction event. So how, how confident are you, um, to folks listening, how, how confident are you that this you know, series of events will culminate in the, you know, the last thing I mentioned, large parts of the earth being uninhabitable and millions rendered homeless and eventually an, extin- an extinction event? Well, I'm afraid, well, again, I can just go back to what the, the science tells you. The situation we're in right now is, I think what, what terrifies the scientists is this, we're going to get into what happened in the Permian, this kind of runaway. And, um, and I've talked about the Amazon being a, a runaway sit, 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 situation when it just changes into a, a savanna and stops creating rain. We're seeing the ice caps. If you look at the Greenland ice cap, Okay, ice caps are white and they reflect heat. And they normally self-cool because they, they're reflecting so much heat. But what's happened in Greenland, it, it's got so warm that they're starting to form these melt pools. They're huge pools, which are dark blue, and that absorbs heat. And what they think is happening with the Greenland ice cap now, it's, it's tipped. So it, it's become, as opposed to self-cooling, it's going to become self-heating. And um, this, th- these sorts of tipping points are hitting all, all the way. And, and the, why the scientists want to put the brakes on emissions now is, is to try to stop all these things rolling away. The permafrost is starting to, to melt, and that gives off more methane and CO2, which is global greenhouse gases. Da, 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 da. So, so if you let this roller coaster start to roll and you can't stop it, and it started to roll, um, you get into this very difficult position of how do you stop it, and this is this 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 is this is the the, the urgency. But the, the picture we have painted is purely an extrapolation, really, of what all scientists say. Well, yeah, if you if you do this, this is this is where we're going to end up. And you know, four degrees warmer doesn't sound like much, does it? You know, well, you know, don't. but we're talking again about global temperature. But you know, this is the ten degrees flux that that confined us to being hunter gatherers it was only 10 degrees but Mm -hmm. in local areas a four degrees hotter world um, makes um, most places which would now be sort of considered desert areas one completely uninhabitable humans can't cool themselves in those kind of conditions if you 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 get what's called hypothermia where where you you basically overheat yourself if you, if the air temperature gets too hot and vast swathes of the world will become like that they will be unless you just live in an air conditioned world you, you won't be able to exist so you know this isn't hypothetical and the thing about the sixth extinction event is is not okay it's sad all these species are going to die it's the this is the it's become so unstable the world that animals can't survive in it and you have to then think so and that it's that instability that really frightens me how can you have settled agriculture when you have got no idea when it's going to rain um or or, when you have droughts that go on for four or five years and then you have deluges for four or five years i grew up in kenya Mm -hmm. and we brits we we have this fireworks evening on the 5th of november 
we some guy tried to blow up our house of parliament um mm -hmm. yeah a few a few centuries back called guy fawkes and every year Brits, yeah we, we know Brits, all about guy fawkes in america <laughs> you know all about, okay sorry it's, it's, anyway no, no, no it was popularized uh by uh the v for vendetta film oh yeah okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. that's our frame of reference yeah yeah brilliant brilliant yeah and anyway um so as a kid guy fawkes night was really important and the rains, the short rains used to happen in Nairobi where, 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 where I lived, either two days before the fifth or two days after. It was that reliable. And farmers could plant their seeds on when the rains would come because it just land like that. Now in Kenya, no one's got any idea when the rains are going to come. Hmm. It's all over the shop. So farmers have had to go into cooperatives and they, they have to plant plants, they seed at different times. They place bets because they've got no idea what the rain's going to do. Wow. And, you know, this is the fundamental change and this is the start of it. Um, but for any farmer anywhere in the world, ask any farmer, is it not different now where you are farming than it was 20 years ago? And they'll all say, yeah. And yeah, that, yeah. It's that's the evidence. Go and ask someone who has to grow food. For Is sure. Is it getting any easier? And and that's exactly why, as as you guys prognosticated, the global food production um is likely to become a problem in the next and and you know the next sixty years. That to me was was what was most surprising was not just, I, th I think people aren't really that shocked that this is the future that lies ahead, but just how soon, you know, we're talking about 10 years from now, um, you know, the or 20 years from now, releasing the, the methane gas, accelerating the rate of climate change. Um, this isn't something that, you know, our grandchildren will be living with. This is something that some of us in our lifetimes might be exposed to. Yeah, yeah, and, and we already are. I mean, I'm, I'm passionate about the marine world. And um, I've made a lot of films about coral, coral reefs. And um, it was only 20 years ago, one of our cameramen was in the Maldives and he, he, he was filming some, 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 something else. And he said, he got on the phone to me and said, this amazing thing's happening. All the reefs have just turned white. And it was the first mass bleaching event of coral reefs. Basically, when the sea gets too high, corals have this little plant that lives in them. Um, if the temp temperature gets too much, the, the, the algae becomes toxic to the coral. It has to ex expel it. Now, the, the algae is its food source, and, and if it expels the algae for too long, it dies. And this is what happened in the Maldives. But anyway, Peter Schoons, he filmed this, this, it looked magical, this white coral reef with colorful fish in it. And we thought, what the hell's going on? Just, you know, that was 1998. Mm -hmm. Now, bleaching events are happening across the world every two or three years. And I think half the Great Barrier Reef, which was an ecosystem everyone thought was untouchable, right. um, has died from bleaching. This has just happened in 20 years. You know, coral reef, and all the coral reef scientists tell you, you know, say, look, it's for 40 years time. You look at the projections of how hot the ocean's going to be. They're just not going to exist. Yeah. And of course, in the Permian extinction, there were corals that, that, that a previous type of coral that was completely extinguished by the Permian extinction for the same reasons. So we're seeing a mirror image. You know, the we we have an expression called the canary in the coal mine. You know, mm -hmm. miners used to take canary down to check if there was gas. Coral reefs bleaching and dying at this level so quickly is a canary in the coal mine, in my view. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was in the documentary as well. I remember seeing the the bleaching yeah, part of yeah. it. So, yeah. you know, we've been talking about the calamity in the environment for the last hour. And I think, to be frank, I think we've ruined a lot of listeners' days, just, just sort of exposing them to the sheer, um, just, you know, catastrophe that lies ahead. I, I do want to sort of, um, you know, wrap up on, on a positive note. Yeah. And, you know, the documentary addresses this in the, in the last 10, 15 minutes of it. You know what what we can do to actually prevent this future from from coming to pass and there are some things that that you touch on the first is population control um and you mentioned that you know there will be 11 billion people on earth by 2100 so why is it important to have uh the population controlled to prevent you know the the mass extinctions that we spoke about i think population is always a multiplier isn't it 
Um, and I always think you've got to be careful talking about pop population because I think you and I in the world that we live in, we consume about as much as 12 people in sub-Saharan Africa would con 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 consume. So um, we're a bigger multiplier because of how much we consume, but, right. but the whole impact of, of pop population is, and everything I've ever learned about populations where countries get richer, um, population falls. And, and, and um, so actually what you want to do is to invest in the economy. If you want to control pop population, you invest. You invest in education, you invest in infrastructure, you invest in these things in the places where it's growing most, and that's the way to control it. But um, so, so it, it, it's a multiplier and we should deal with it and take it serious, seriously. But, but on the other thing, in terms of hope, um, I think in the last five years, we've just seen the world is changing. And um, renewable energy, even 10 years ago, if you people could have said, oh, actually, we can subsidize, we, we, we can get rid of fossil fuel and we can just live on renewable energy, people would have laughed you out of the room. Yeah. Um, but now in, in Britain, we have days when half our energy is generated by wind. Um, we have a lot of wind here, <laughs> and um, but the combination of wind and solar, is, so so is you know is becoming, and it's also becoming cheaper. Mm -hmm. So it, it's now we're almost hitting a tipping point there, where renewable energy seems to be that it just becomes the most um, the economic solution for people to get cheaper energy. Um, so that can change really fast. So emissions may fall far, far faster than we ever thought. And they may fall because just people just want cheap energy and renewables cheaper. You know, so that's absolutely brilliant. Um, the other great hope, the, the way out of this mess is to, one is, okay, you deal with emissions like that. The other thing is to have to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Mm. Um, in the Holocene times, there were 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now we're at 417. So we've got to try and get the 417 money back to around about 300. The thing that takes carbon out better than anything is the natural world. Um, and they are the great carbon sums. So all you have to do is just protect the natural world. And they worked out, you just have to protect 30% of it and you can use the rest of it. The ocean, you protect 30%, you can fish the hell out of, out of the other half, you'll get more fish in it. So the, 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 it's a sort of a win-win. And the wonderful thing about the natural world, you don't have to invent it, you don't have to build anything. You just, you have to on an industrial scale, protect it, properly protect it. Uh, and then it just does the job. But then you get all these other things, you know, the Amazon protected keeps the rainfall coming. You know, you 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 get all that stability back. Your soils get enhanced. Your pop, your insect, the little things that can undo us. Suddenly, you get more little things, and so it all starts to work back again, hmm. back to a safe place. And it's not that difficult. That's the crazy thing. It is not that difficult, and uh, just needs will. Now we've got the technology. Scientists know what to do. Um, they've worked it all out. It's just now about will. So, okay, we, we've hit on a lot, uh, you know, uh, some, some great potential solutions here. So population control is one. Um, you mentioned phasing out fossil fuels and focusing on alternative energy. I think you're right. I think that's, that's very much in vogue right now. Um, you mentioned that um, actually pulling the carbon out of the environment. So on that note, the oceans are a part of it, but also the forests. I think the documentary talks about halting de deforestation and actually um, offering grants to, to landowners to, to replant native trees. So is that part of, you know, pulling yeah. the carbon out? I, I think keep the forests you've got and certainly replant. Um, soil is another thing that's it's actually really important. We didn't in the film talk about that, but soil absorbs huge, huge quantities of carbon and healthy soil is the thing that keeps our civilization going and, and um you know we we've just got to stop hammering soil the way we do we do whether it's pesticides 
um, other chemicals, uh, you know, but, but soil, so having areas of natural grassland and what have you and healthy soil, um, and also more careful agricultural practices, all of this stuff can make a huge, huge difference. Um, but I'll tell you a, a really interesting article, a friend of mine is a marine biologist told me, we, we, we have a sea between us and Europe, it's called the North Sea. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important sea because it's, it's actually very shallow, it's only about 100 feet deep. And um, naturally it has the ability to absorb vast quantities of carbon. I mean, you, you know, some people say equivalent to emissions from aviation, so really important. But every year we bottom dredge the, every foot of the full sea for, for, for fishing, which is actually a quite a very small industry. But that turns that seabed from being a huge carbon sump into a carbon emitter. Hmm. And then you look at this, you look at, so what's in your and my interests from the North Sea? It's probably a stable climate where we can have a lovely, our civilization can carry on and, 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 and what have you. But because of a very, very small industry that insists on a destructive fishing practice, they're undermining your future. And we have to start to look at how we run our world and think, actually, what's in the common interest for all of us, for the most people on the earth? Uh, where do we invest our money? What's, in our, what's our national and international protection policy? And you start then looking at well, what we do with the world in a very, very different, different way. But we've got to kind of, I think, start to do that. Be more business focused on and analytical about what is the in the interests of most people. Right. Um, and we're not doing that right now. And for folks listening, I, I mean, these are all incredible initiatives for people to take on the large scale, like for, for governments to take with restricting fishing practices and halting deforestation. For folks listening, Keith, you know, what can they do today in their everyday life to, you know, prevent these, these catastrophic things from coming to pass? Is, is there something that they can do? Yeah, the first thing, and I've, I've nicked this from someone else, but it's a, it's a really brilliant idea. The first thing is really understand the nature of the problem. Because once you understand the nature of the problem, everything else will follow. I used to sort of say, well, you know, maybe you can change your diet and not eat quite so much meat. And yeah. But once you understand the nature of the problem, why we are all, the instability of the earth, what I've talked about, the, the road we're going down is a problem for all of us. It's certainly a problem for our children, our children's children. So once you really are convinced that you know that and you understand why it's happening, then everything else just becomes easy. Of course, you'll tell your friends, come and do this. Of course, you'll vote for that politician who's going to do what's right for your children and your grandchildren. Of course, you're going to maybe, you know, use less carbon, consume less, or, or, or whatever. But it all stems from that basic understanding of a real clear understanding of what's going on and why it is important and why it's urgent. Um, so that's what I will say. Just dig into it. Find it. Um, immerse yourself in it and then everything else follows. Absolutely. Absolutely. Keith, this has been an incredible conversation. Um, so for folks who have not yet had the chance to, to watch the Netflix film, A Life on Our Planet, um, very moving. As I said, um, it, it will be emotionally difficult to watch, but it is critical that you watch it, that you share with your friends and that you learn about these issues. And that's why these, these conversations are so important. Keith, I'm sure listeners want to know where they can go to, to learn more about uh, you and, and your work and, and your films. Uh, well, I, I run a company called Silverback Films and we have a, a website that does does that. But um, I think if you want to learn more about this issue, we, the, we, we did do another series on Netflix called Our Planet, which was, um, and with the Our Planet, we, we partnered with the WWF um, uh, World Wildlife Fund um, and created a whole lot of content online that goes with it. So have a look at ourplanet.com if, you, if you're really interested in these, because it's full of 
interesting solutions and stories about um, how we can solve a lot of these things. So um, I suppose to, frankly, I'm not particularly inter interesting. <laughs> Ourplanet.com is a lot more interesting. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I'm definitely going to check out the, the the Netflix series Our Planet as well. Um, but I think I think you hit the nail on the head earlier. This is the the greatest problem facing you know an existential crisis for humanity. And I'm going to be watching that conference in Glasgow. You said yeah. it. You know, it might be sort of a, a turning point for um, for mankind. Hopefully, people band together and and you know prioritize the issue. I I think so. I mean, there's some there's. There are a lot of great people going there who've got the right intentions. So um, I'm very help, hope, hopeful about it. I think I think the world may come together in quite a unique way um, this November. For sure, um, for sure. So push them all in that direction. Absolutely. Listen, this has been a delight. Um, I've, I've learned a lot and I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Great speaking to you. Thanks.